Wake skating in its easiest definition will be what most people describe as wakeboarding without the bindings. I like to think of it more as skateboarding on the water. You're not connected, you're riding a board with grip tape, and you're doing skate style tricks. It's literally become my life over the past 10 years, and it's been a very fortunate, lucky life, and it's all because of just stepping on the board the first time. Growing up in the Keys was a beautiful childhood. I don't think even at the time I knew how great it was, because as a kid, you're just kind of born into wherever you're at. The community is amazing. It's different than just living somewhere, like you are part of that place. So I think that's why the community feels such a responsibility for the Keys. It feels like it's our little piece of the world. Like everything I do, I kind of almost say like, doing it for the home team. <laughs> you know, like as corny as that sounds, if anybody from the Keys does something, everyone in the Keys is pumped. You know, we're all so proud of each other that do anything. I grew up in Key West, uh, lived my whole life there. When Danny was born, we had been married three years. We were really weren't planning on having children right away. He was kind of a little bit of a surprise, but we were extremely happy. And we were just having a great time, and Danny just added to that. As an infant, we took him to swim classes. He learned to swim as an infant. We got into snorkeling and he would gather lobster and fish for our dinner and then it progressed from there. We actually put him on a knee board when he was only like 18, 20 months old. And I was definitely influenced by my dad. And me and him would go doubles knee boarding and stuff as a little kid and I'd like jump on the back of his knee board and put on like little shows for the people on the boat. Those first memories of like doing that stuff with my dad and like the happiness and like how psyched people were and all that definitely like, I think really lit something inside of me that I wasn't even conscious of till later on. I wanted to chase those feelings of even those little accomplishments we were doing back then, you know, later on, which led me to trying to tell so much in wake skating and everything else. Growing up, my dad's always a huge influence in my life. He was always the guy, you know, like, I mean, especially in my eyes, just the, the coolest guy. In a lot of people's eyes, I think, kind of a, a super wild man he used to be, and he's just, he's awesome, he's my hero. I was born in Hollywood, Florida, and grew up in Miami and the Keys. Jackie and I had just came home from college. We were dating. She was living in Key West. I was living up here in Isla Mirada, about a 90 mile difference between us. I happened to be down there one weekend and we borrowed her uncle's boat. It was a beautiful day and we're out there. We get in the water and we're swimming around, picking up shells. And we happened to see a snapper, a hogfish for dinner. And I went down and shot it, brought it up. I said, hey, let's take it to the boat. And right after I said that, bam. A shark hit me instead of the fish it was chasing. Quite a, a bite on my leg, it like severed my calf all the way to the bone. By the time we got her in the boat, we got to the hospital, which was about four miles back to shore. She had lost half the blood in her body. It was at that point I knew, I knew I wanted to spend the rest of my life with her. Because I saw how tough she was and how she handled the situation. And I was blessed that down the road when I did ask her to marry me, she chose to do so. He's my hero. I was actually doing water sports before I can even remember. And that was definitely influenced by my dad. Going on vacation with my parents in North Carolina, and we were driving up there. And I don't even remember where it was, but my dad bought a wakeboarding magazine. And I remember I read that wakeboarding magazine probably 30 times on that trip. It was a long drive. And from then on, I just knew I wanted, I was like, man, I, I think I want a wakeboard. Or, I want to be a pro wakeboarder now, it's my new thing. I think I was like 10 years old. From that first magazine I got, I was just like obsessed, you know? Watch the videos over and over again and read the magazines cover to cover. I think I like remember a lot of things about certain people better than they remember themselves from that time. So I got back to the Keys. We had all kind of discovered this thing and wanted to do it and we all started wakeboarding. My friend Topher had like a 14 foot whaler, 
I had a 16 foot Sea Ray with an outboard motor. Just these little boats we were growing up wakeboarding and wakes game behind. We literally like went through puberty in those boats out in the bay of the Florida Keys. So it, was, it almost made it more special for me, and it still does. Like those experiences I had with my friends back then makes it like wake skating and everything means so much more to me because like that was our childhood. That's where we became men. Like we had playboys out there. You know. Danny, Land what what is this? You know, we'd bring girls out there. Like just being the biggest nerd, goofball kids, and just figuring out life. It was cool, you know. Like that was our sanctuary. Like that was the only place we could go to really ourselves at that time. I killed a man in Reno just to watch him die. <laughs> well, that train keeps on rolling. He was wakeboarding and he was doing things, you know, really good. He would jump ramps. We wanted to get better, so we decided we'd take a trip to the wakeboard camp. He went to the wakeboard camp in Claremont, Florida with a group of friends from the Keys. Before I even went to the wakeboard camp, I remember my friend Thomas Warren being like, man, that guy Aaron Reed's there, you gotta wake skate in front of him. You know, we were just like so into it, we knew who this guy was. And first couple days Aaron wasn't there, I was just wakeboarding and then Aaron came and I wake skated for him, it was kind of like an instant connection. Danny came to the wakeboard camp, he was I think 14 years old and he came with uh, his regular crew of friends, the old Indian Mound Boys. I, I just happened to get them on my boat. They were like, oh Danny wake skates, Danny wake skates and I was blown away by this kid. I mean, this sport is brand new at this time. I had just gotten some of my first pictures in the magazine. I mean, I didn't really think there was just random kids out there just shredding like this. There he was, just killing it. Not even scared, just he was gonna show me what he had. Aaron just said, yeah, man, like, quit wakeboarding now and just continue wake skating. I told him, hey, like, go home, film you wake skating. Don't wakeboard, you're, you're crushing it. Film wake skating and send me a sponsor me tape and I'll Get it to Thomas Farrell. Mikey, his younger brother, four years difference, was just a little kid videoing it for him. It was crazy. You know, I was filming him with just a small handheld, you know, video camera. So it was cool to be able to work with him and see him progress and uh, be a part of something so awesome. So once Aaron cracked the door and told me I could go through it if I worked hard and went for it, from that little bit of inspiration and that spark, someone telling me that what I really love to do, I could do and maybe make something for myself, I just knew like this was an opportunity and I'm gonna go for it with everything I have. In the month period after we left the wakeboard camp, Danny got exponentially good. I guess there's always been an end goal with me like of what I've wanted to accomplish on the water and it started back then. Just obsessing over wakeboarding, wake skating, skateboarding, we were just obsessing over like being on a board. And from all those different influences, that's why I eventually when I came to wake skating, like I was like, this is perfect. I've ridden all these different boards, I've been so into all these different things, but this makes sense to me, like a light bulb moment. I think it was like three or four months later that I get in the mail at the wakeboard camp a VHS tape and a handwritten letter from Danny. Really nice penmanship. He said, Mr. Harrell, blah, 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 uh, addressed to me, like, which is typical Danny. Funny, but I don't know, totally humble. We were getting a lot of sponsoring tapes at the time because the team was growing and it was young. And so I watched the tape and I was blown away. I was like, this is some kid with this incredible talent. Initially, upon seeing him, I was like, yeah, there's something that I've never seen before happening and it's somebody that obviously has a heavy skate influence doing this thing on this board that is not like anything I've ever seen and we just basically were like all right this is the future and we are here witnessing it from a 14 year old kid. He was doing it and Thomas saw it and freaked out and was like we have to put this kid on. It's like the dream kid to, to come into wake skating and make it super nuts like to make it go way off the deep end. So after Thomas got the video, he told me I could go to Surf Expo in Orlando and meet with him. He just said, yeah man, love what you're doing. He gave me a board at Expo, like an older four track. It had been used a little bit and stuff, but I remember leaving Surf Expo and then just being like, oh my gosh, you know, like I had gotten the confirmation I was looking for and it was such an exciting feeling. And then Thomas told me there'd be some boards in the mail. And then I remember the day the boards came. Like I have pictures of myself with the boards. It was so elated because like that was my dream coming true right there was just getting those boards. I was set, like, you know, life was good. To understand Cassette, you kind of have to understand Thomas Harrell's path. Thomas started out as a wakeboarder. He was top of the line in terms of style and video parts. 
But Thomas had this real passion for wake skating, and Thomas turned that passion eventually into cassette wake skates. He started his own brand. It was the dream of what Thomas wanted wake skating to be. I think he was fed up with kind of the corporate structure, the tournament structure of wakeboarding, and the fact that it wasn't very artistically appealing to him. Cassette was an extension of Thomas's vision of wake skating. And Thomas went out on his own and he put together a team and he got a warehouse and he had the manufacturing and he did everything by himself. And it was almost exactly what the wakeboard industry needed. Cassette kind of had this anti-establishment, new crew kind of vibe. And in wakeboarding at the time, there just wasn't really those kind of guys around and they were them. <laughs> Thomas was a skateboarder, he always was. And he had this vision of wake skating and what it could be, not wake skating on a, a wakeboard, but actually wake skating. And I just feel like Thomas's vision for that, nobody else was really there as far as the concept of the company, the board, I mean, making wood boards, putting grip tape on boards, riding with shoes. People made fun of me for using shoes in the water, like straight up. I remember people and pros at the time being like, you are, you're wearing your shoes in the water, this is stupid. And I was like, yeah, I know, but this is way better. Grip tape, shoes. This works. You have so many more possibilities with the board. You're opening up everything by using the whole board instead of just these two pads that you put your feet on. So I was like, you know, people can make fun of me and whatever, but this it seems like a direction where it should go and it did go that direction and it was cool. Thomas kind of had an idea of what he wanted wake skating to be. And I think Danny, when he first kind of burst onto the scene, was that thing incarnated. This kid's lived many lives and he's been around a long time. You can see it in his eyes, he's got a lot of history, just spiritually, I believe, you know? I think he's just a, a deep person. So I think Thomas saw that and latched onto someone that could, you know, really be a kind of a shining star to what Cassette was trying to be, that maybe something that Thomas couldn't quite be for Cassette. Danny was kind of the idea that everybody knew was floating around out there, that there was a, a kid that was as good or better than the people that we had seen for a couple years, that he was out there kind of waiting to be discovered. That represented something big in terms of what I did, which was, was kind of inform the wake skating enthusiasts about what was going on at the time. It was kind of like a new discovery. And you knew it was gonna be a well-received one because not only did Thomas want that, you knew that there was thousands of people out there that were also interested in that. I went to Miami like the day before my 15th birthday and that's when I started filming for Sfumato. Sfumato was the second Cassette Wake Skates video that I was a part of and Aaron was a part of. And that was kind of the video that really brought wake skating to the next level. It definitely changed everyone's vision of what wake skating was or could be. It's when Chase Hebner was filming a bunch for us and Letchworth was there. That was the first day I met Josh Letchworth. It was the day before his birthday in November. His parents dropped him off with us and I remember them getting out of the car and like kind of handing him over and I remember it was this big moment of like Danny kind of leaving his parents. It felt like it was like they were dropping him off at college, leaving the nest and coming into this wild cassette team. Danny's first opportunity was a photo shoot in Key Biscayne in Miami with the cassette team. And the cassette team at the time was a pretty tight-knit group. So for them to invite somebody, especially somebody so young, into the fold and kind of give them a tryout meant something. There were guys that had been trying to break into the cassette team and trying to get on the inside, but they were pretty tough on that. They didn't let just anybody in. So for Danny to go on that photo shoot in Miami, that was a big deal. I remember pulling up to the dock and Danny walking out and he was just this quiet little dude. I didn't even like realize he was there the whole time. And then basically he jumped in the water and just started ripping. And it was, you know, you watched him and you know, he was definitely like, even then like on the level of Thomas and like doing all these like crazy tricks. And, and you just kind of realized that this kid was going to be like the future of wake skating. He was a really technical rider for back in that era when kids were just learning how to kick flip and do stuff like that. Danny had all of that stuff on lock. It was just kind of amazing to watch him ride because he just had, he had a different kind of style than we were used to and, and could do things on the board that nobody really seen yet. Doing kick flips, like no one would, had ever seen anyone do a kick flip on a wake skate the way Danny was doing it. It just all happened all 
in less than a year, just the kid, I met him and then, bam, he was on the team, he was filming for Sumato, he was getting an opener. They were trying really hard, but I don't think it was to make money. They just wanted to succeed and uh, they wanted to have Cassette be the number one wake skate company, void of any connection to any water ski or wakeboarding manufacturer. The cassette team as a group, it's hard to like really list off the members because it was almost like a collective of people that would gather around Thomas. And, like some of these people didn't even wake skate, but they're just, you know, maybe skateboarders or people that are doing art. There's all these different ideas always just like circulating around us. I think he almost always saw himself as a water sports like Andy Warhol, you know, and like he wanted to surround himself with all these interesting people. And we were just like, we were at the center of that. So we were just having all these ideas fed to us. As a collective, that's what made it so different than other things in water sports. And how we were able to bring so many new ideas to the water and the way the videos were filmed and all that is because there's just this whole creative atmosphere of different people around us. The core team, the guys that were filming, you know, me, Aaron, Thomas, Jim, we were just so focused on pushing those ideas that were all around us on the water. It was this tight-knit factory of ideas almost. So I was so open to all the new ideas, I loved it. And as a little kid, I'm just like a sponge, like absorbing everything these guys are doing. And Thomas's thing was, and he was, we are wake skating, we didn't have any money, and he was trying to help us out and trying to get us with sponsors that would take care of us, and he always did his best to do that. Cassette's like super small, pretty much, you know, broke, and then we're just like, all right, let's see if we can get these guys boat sponsorships or get them shoe deals or get them like anything. When I met Danny Hampson, I had had the luxury of doing some research on him to try and find out if he was gonna be one of the next athletes that we were gonna bring on to the Oakley Wake team and he had come suggested from several other athletes as well as some of the retailers that we were working with at the time. Danny and Oakley just seemed kind of made for each other and just like everything else with Thomas, it was, he could see it before everybody else. Getting on Oakley was almost like him kind of like being not just a wake skater and really good at it, but also like a professional athlete for Oakley as well, which appealed to Danny's athletic sense. It was a perfect fit and I was really happy to introduce him and I was really happy that the deal worked Looking back at those early days of working with Danny, the moment that really stands out is when we decided as a program to sponsor him. We're identifying you out of a small handful of other wakeboarders and you're gonna be the first wake skater to be on our team. So now that we had a team, it was time to go out and do some photo shoots and create some advertising and some marketing. And we talked to Danny about what he wanted to do and he suggested bringing on Josh Letchworth as a photographer. In those early days of trying to get the right shot at the right time, I really think that Danny and Josh had to rethink their whole process. They sent over a set of slides and when I got them, I knew exactly at the time this was the shot and this is what we're going to run for an ad and we're also going to run it for a poster. I knew I really wanted to do something that would stand out and kind of be special and, and then to take a kickflip, just doing it off flat water down a gap was pretty big I guess. I don't know, no one had, no one had done it before. I just felt like it really was bringing that skateboard aspect to the water and I know Thomas was really happy with it and then of course I think Maddie was happy with what me and Letra were set out to do and getting it done. It was definitely a unique looking shot, like no one had seen a shot like that in a magazine before. I think that was kind of like the first time, whether we realized it, you know, consciously or not, was the first time we kind of got a sense of the marriage between Josh and Danny as photographer and subject. That was like a really special relationship for Alliance. You know, we ran dozens of photos of Danny that Josh took. You know, I think that was really kind of the first instance where I can remember thinking, okay, Danny Hampson, Josh Letchworth shoots him. I mean, I've taken photos of Danny and sequences of Danny that have run in the magazine, and because of his writing, you know, they look good. But Josh and Danny, that was just kind of like salt and pepper in terms of the photo, you know? There wasn't a lot of direction. There wasn't him asking me what he wanted to do. It was like, I start pointing the camera at him. He just kind of blossomed, you know? He just kind of, he looked good on camera. And I mean, that's how you get the best images is when somebody's completely 100% themselves and comfortable. I remember feeling that every time I was with Danny. That's why I have an entire archive of Danny. Thomas is killing it, Danny's coming up, Aaron's coming up, these guys are insane. Like, no one's really looking at it like what it really was. It was pretty unique because we didn't really know what was possible, and that's what we were trying to 
achieve was things that hadn't been done before. Something you really didn't see in normal water sports companies. So they were a family that like started a company and then 10 years later we kind of realized they pretty much started a movement. basically watched the motto and the videos that Danny was in over and over and over again, just trying to model my flip tricks after his and try and learn the flip tricks that he did. Um, I guess that was uh, my favorite part about him. And not so much just the flip tricks, but how they were done. Um, you know, he, he really um, put an emphasis on style and how the tricks were done as opposed to just how many he could do. That era was kind of a crazy time um, in all of our lives. We were young and just kind of taking that company on our own. We were this young upstart group of guys that, I mean, we went in RVs and partied and went on trips and we had an awesome time. It's a different lifestyle and but I can remember, you know, some tour stops where some crazy stuff happened, some weird stuff happened. <laughs> it was just, and Danny was there all along and it never seemed as though there was a 14-year-old or a 15-year-old kid or a 16-year-old throughout the years. It never seemed like that. It was just, I mean, just the same way Danny is now to me. I he might as well be my age. An old soul, I guess. That's what everyone says about Dan. They're partying hard. Danny is killing it. But he's getting in a mix that, you know, you've heard all these crazy stories about all these other action sports dudes that just fall off the map because you get sucked into that party mode. So Danny, was, I mean, the best way I could put it would be a roller coaster ride <laughs> with Thomas and Aaron at the helm of Danny Hampson, you know? I was just a little kid from the Keys, not even like used to being in a city or like anywhere. And then, like, I get thrown in the mix with all these guys who are just, you know, very used to a different way of life. From 15 to 20, Danny was just on a completely different field than a kid. Danny's traveling around the world with these cassette dudes having probably the time of his life, but also not growing up like a normal kid. A small group of guys filming hard, living hard, and just kind of trying to change something for the better. Cassette is doing so much. We're coming out with innovative products. Me and Aaron are laying down some of the best riding of our careers, pushing each other. All these great things are happening, but at the same time, Cassette's having all these warranty issues, all these manufacturing problems, and the company as a business is not sustaining itself. So all, even though we're pushing everything as hard as we can, and everything's so innovative and amazing, we're not making any money. I remember the call very vividly of when Thomas told me that I should look into some other options because it was, the ship had kind of sailed. There was so much emotion, it was more than just a sponsor, you know, it was, it was so much of my life. Even though it was a short period of time, like I said, we were doing so many different things. It was definitely a really hard loss, uh, losing cassette and that whole ideal we had. And really it was challenging for me to find a new fit and a new direction for my riding because all I knew of wake skating and what I wanted from it as far as a sport was concerned or the direction I wanted the sport to go was through cassette.
when the cassette of fall happened. The one guy that's always been there for me, Aaron Reed, got me all set up over at Liquid Force. I started talking to Liquid Force and I negotiated my deal with them. I also told Don Wallace that Danny Hampson had to get a deal too. It was a perfect home, it was a perfect match for us. We were both getting comfortable there. We are both starting to ride really good and get used to the boards. We're making boards that we like to ride. And then a couple months after all that stuff started going well, Mother's Day 2006, was one of the worst days of my life. So it was Mother's Day. Not the best Mother's Day. We've gone out with a crew of people. This place called the Sandbar, and people are partying for sure. It, it seemed like it was getting late. We were about ready to have dinner. I got in a boat with this guy I wasn't even out there with. He was just heading in. I noticed right away he was driving pretty erratically and stuff. He was really kind of swerved to miss something he said or just lost control of the boat. And next thing I know, you know, probably going 50 miles an hour to zero, way up in these mangroves. But I was thrown from the boat. I was thrown up in the trees. Um, there was branches through my neck, branches all in my head, my back was cut to pieces, I was kind of suspended there. Uh, dispatch toned us out for a boating accident on the bay side of Snake Creek. Uh, at the time of the call out, they didn't know how many patients we had or the exact incident that had occurred, they just knew it was a boating accident. They had Coast Guard and the Sheriff's Office Marine units en route, and they ended up bringing two patients back to the Coast Guard station. I knew Danny, yes, of course. Um, however, at the time, with the uh, fact he's soaking wet and he had multiple lacerations on his head and on his chest and stuff with the blood, at first I didn't recognize him. And then when he began to speak, I recognized immediately who he was. They no longer needed me there, so I needed to notify Tim and Jackie that something had happened. He knocked on our door and he's like, I have something to tell you that I didn't want you to hear from somebody else. And we're like, what? And he's like, your son has been in a very, very serious boating accident. Obviously, we rushed over to the hospital, and there I saw my brother on a stretcher. He was covered in blood from head to toe. And that was probably one of the worst nights of my life. You know, I watched my brother get onto the uh, helicopter, and they had to rush him to uh, you know, a trauma center. And your mind's just going a million different directions. Just carted him off to the helicopter real quick, and the only thing I saw of Danny was him raising up his thumb and giving us a thumbs up. And then he flew away in the, the helicopter. He left and his little brother, Mikey, who was 14 at the time, and he just dropped to his knees and started crying, and that was awful. Danny Hampson uh, suffered a fracture of the occipital condyle, basically a fracture at the base of his skull. The accident in itself also caused damage to the brachial plexus, which is a nerve bundle that basically is in charge of the motor function of your arm. Normally with that uh, type of injury, um, they don't make it um, through. Uh, apparently Danny had an angel watch him that day and, and uh, decided that he had more things to do with his life, so we don't really see stuff like that here. I just wanted him to be able to, you know, get all his homework and finish his school and just be at home with us and us take care of him and, and put him through all the physical therapy to get well. I just wanted to care for him. Um, I never once thought about wake skating or any of that stuff. It never even entered my mind. That was the last thing I thought of. There was no promises when I first did it that my arm was just going to start firing again. They even told me there's a chance I could quit again. And once I started to progress and go through my therapy and all that, I was definitely a little bit worried. You worry, if am I gonna ever be able to do what I did again? You worry you might never get it back. That's scary, because you wanna be able to get back to where you were if you really love something and be able to keep pushing. Danny at the beginning was very concerned, relatively apprehensive and maybe he's a little bit scared. About a week and uh, he was improving exponentially. I mean, you knew he was gonna make it back. He was getting the movement back in his arm. That seemed like the big thing. But there was also a question of, could his career continue? You know, Could the one fall paralyze him or worse? I, honestly, I think we were all thinking that more than Danny was. Danny just seemed really introspective about how he had gotten to this point. And he seemed a little remorseful, a little guilty. Um, you know, it's something you wouldn't pick up on unless you actually knew him. You would think that, you know, oh man, this guy's just, uh, he's bummed because he almost died. But I think that he was more bummed 
about the way he had been living at that point. And in a weird way, I think he almost felt like he deserved that wake up call. It was such a shocking self-realization type of thing that I first had to deal with the guilt I felt for put, putting myself in that situation, for getting hurt and doing that to all the people I love. I wasn't really worried about Wakes getting in. I was just thanking God I was alive and I could move and do all that. Towards the tail end of my rehabilitation, uh, Maddie Swanson decided he wanted me to kind of start getting out there and decided to take me on a trip to Toronto for Wakestock. And I still had my J collar on, my neck was still unstable. And on that trip to Toronto, I met uh, someone named Phil Kerr, who ended up being one of, the, uh, one of the people that really changed my life and changed my perspective. When I was 13, I got cancer on my spine. I had a tumor that was strangling my spine, and I spent about a year doing chemo and in a rehab facility. First time I met Danny Hampson, it was about eight years ago now. He was very scared from his accident, and I think just even looking at me, he was picturing himself, he could have been there, you know? And I remember he, he got teary-eyed a few times with me. Like, I just met the dude, and, and he seemed so like powerful and real. And Danny showed me, you know, I can wakeboard and travel and do this, and pretty much changed my life. I, I want to live my life like Phil. A guy who lives full blast, kind to everybody, and never once like feels sorry for himself. When you're around that kind of energy, it's impossible not to be inspired. I know that it was something that he used as kind of a fulcrum point for. Okay, that's all in the past now. I need to, I need to decide what I'm going to do in the future. And luckily. Uh, it didn't take too long for him to decide that he wanted to rededicate himself to his wake skate career. I actually remember the first day that he wake skated uh, after his neck injury. So I was really afraid to ride. Um, and then one day, I was, I, I was, this is the day I'm going to ride. I was just going to try it. And I remember going out and doing an inside out 180 and just being like the biggest feeling of relief. Like, everything's going to be okay. Like, I really have hit the jackpot, like my life is going to be back to normal. And I remember that first fall being so scared, just like doing lip tricks, but just taking that first fall and like coming up out of the water and just like, I was just laughing. Like I just came so close to having everything ruined. To get back on the water doing what I love was the craziest feeling. It makes me really emotional to think about the whole thing because it just, you get a second chance and not many people do. Started riding again in October, and then December we had our first international trip filming for Oakley's Push Process, which I knew was gonna be probably the biggest movie up to that point I had ever worked on. Hungry for good vibes and good energy and riding. Pushing the process. Pushing the progress. <laughs> and I was really nervous. Like I really wanted to keep going where I had left off as far as my video parts, because I was really proud of everything I had done leading up to that. And I was just, I remember being really nervous, like, I don't know if I can do it again. And then I went to Australia, filmed for the push process, and I had all that nervous energy. Maddie was there, all the whole team was there, and one day I went out and I did like my first wake to wake big spin, and I just remember like, I dropped the handle, and like, I usually don't do that, but like, dropped the handle real cool. He'd been injured almost the entire time of the production, and he pushed himself and landed that big spin over the wake, and and from there, I really believe that Danny took his career to new heights. It felt great, you know, I was like, I think I am going to be able to come back. And as scared as I was and as hard as the rest of that year was and that movie was, it was like, I knew it was going to be okay. Aaron would call me every day. Evernight Liquid Force always made it clear that when I was ready to ride again, I could come back and have something stable, so. From that support and from all the experiences me and Aaron have had through our years wake skating together and this incredible friendship and relationship we have, we decided we really wanted to create something of our own. And that enters into Obscure Wake Skates, which is basically me and Aaron's little love child. And we kind of wanted to have this separate image that obviously emulated cassette and what we had there and and we wanted the team aspect and we wanted to film a video and we we just really wanted to recreate 
what we loved and what we had. And I think at the same time, be able to try to help new wake skaters coming up in the way that Thomas had helped us and to try to push these young new faces. And Obscura is insane and it puts them back in that, you know, their own world and where they're controlling what they're doing and they have their own look and identity and I think that's super important and I think it's important for wake skating that Obscura is there and it's not liquid force wake skates. During the filming of push process, I was kind of just getting back into the rhythm of filming and everything after my injury, and then I broke my ankle really bad, dislocated it, so I had to have surgery and a plate and a bunch of screws put in there. That was so unfortunate just because I was starting to get momentum, starting to feel good again about where the direction my riding was going in, and to have a setback like that right when you feel like you're getting it back was definitely like really disappointing, but luckily it was just a couple months and I was able to to get back on board again. I came back from the ankle injury and I was doing really well, like push process one video of the year, put out two video parts in that short amount of time, and all these good things going on and then blew my knee, which was again, just like right when you feel like you're kind of, you know, you finally got the ball going the right direction just to have it halt again. It just you get hurt, right? And you do anything, you're gonna get hurt. You can't feel that sorry for yourself, you know, when there's so many other things that happen to people so much worse. It's just time and time and just mentally just you know, knowing you're gonna come back. The injuries definitely plagued him and his time. The kid would just always come back and always come back to the level, not that he left at, but the level that we were at at the time, you know, whatever it had progressed to in the time that he was out. It was such a crazy couple of years I had there, with cassette going out of business, me breaking my neck, my ankle, my knee, so many different injuries. To finally get healthy and have Obscura going good and all these positive things happening, I started to progress my riding and started feeling really good on my board and really loving it and enjoying it again. Somehow I won Alliance Rider of the Year. The Alliance Rider of the Year is kind of symbolic of the guy that everybody couldn't look away from that year. Riders consider it a fairly prestigious award. Uh, it's voted on not just by Alliance staff, but the main votes come from past Riders of the Year. So these are their peers, and for them to recognize Danny and everything that he had been through, all of the uh, recoveries from his neck injury, knee injury, his ankle breaking. It was a big moment for him. I know that he never really rode for awards, but when he got that call, I know that he was happy. And I couldn't have been more happy for him to finally make it there. What I always wanted to win was that, and then I got it, and it was just validation for everything I had done up to that point. But at the same time, it motivated me to ride that much harder. When you try to go to sleep
had had a lot of obstacles overcome and he always seemed like he came back. You know, it would have been easy for Danny to quit given all the adversity that he had. I mean, he almost died. And then he had two major injuries and he lost his board sponsor. And, you know, he's an emotional guy that feels all these things maybe more than most people do. He literally, from the very beginning, is the same kid that he was that I met on the boat that day when he was 14. He hasn't changed and his attitude is just, you know, always been the same. He, and he loves life and he loves to live life, he loves to laugh, he loves to have a good time, but he just happens to be incredibly talented whenever he sets foot on a board. The level he's at now, he's progressing at a good pace, at a steady pace to keep up with everybody. His boat stuff's insane, he's doing well on the wake skate tour. Danny's got room to be in this sport for 20 years if it keeps growing as it is today. To see him ride the way he does and to know how much time he was injured and like he's done all of this in such a short period of time, like the progression that he's had in the last few years. I mean, he's always been the best, but the last few years, I mean, I think between him having more time and then the sport growing, the sport progressing, and him realizing that he has to stay hungry to stay the best, and he does it. And after 10, 11, however many years it's been that he's been doing this, it's pretty incredible that he still has that hunger and that drive to be on top of the sport. I've just had the most lucky, incredible, blessed life. I grew up on the water in the Florida Keys. I found wake skating at a young age, and it's allowed me to have all these amazing experiences and meet so many incredible people. And I've definitely made a lot of mistakes. I think life kind of ebbs and flows, and you need a great support system to get through those low tide moments. And I have that with incredible family and friends and sponsors, and I've just been so lucky to have them all there behind me and pushing me through.